Welcome, welcome, and one more welcome, and another one welcome to everybody. Part of our continuing series where we talk to professors, scholars, writers, philosophers, columnists, reporters, activists, anybody who can uh, think intelligently about where we are in America regarding the topic of political polarization. With us today is Dr. Amber Gaffney. Uh, she works in the Department of Psychology, not Political Science, at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, Dr. Gaffney received her PhD in social psychology from the Claremont Graduate University in 2014. She received her undergraduate degree in psychology from Cal Poly Humboldt in 2006. She completed a postdoctorate fellowship with Dr. Michael Hogg at the Claremont Graduate University and has taught and worked at the Claremont Graduate University, Claremont McKenna College and Pomona College in Claremont, California and at Whittier College in Whittier, California. Dr. Gaffney is currently an assistant professor of psychology at Cal Poly Humboldt and serves as an associate for group processes and intergroup relations. Uh, oh, we are, uh, yeah, she's also a affiliate member of the Social Identity Lab at the Claremont Graduate Institute, uh, Claremont Graduate University G CGU Social Identity Lab. It's an impressive place. And the Group Processes and Leadership Lab at the University of Alberta, Alberta Leadership Lab. Uh, Dr. Gaffney's research, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is focused on social identity, group processes, and social influence. Her current work focuses on how prototypical and non-prototypical group members can create and manage uncertainty to enact social change. She has researched minority influence, group polarization, leadership, and attitude change from social identity and self-categorization perspective. In addition, her work has examined gender stereotypes and leadership and prejudice toward both out-group and in-group members. I might ask you about that. Because Dr. Gaffney is particularly interested in political identities and changing political ideology, her work often focuses on social and political issues. With us, we're going to be covering this work here. Further to the right, Uncertainty, Political Polarization, and the American Tea Party Movement, published in 2013 almost 10 years ago. Roughly what it said was the Tea Party entered U.S. politics in a time of economic uncertainty, positioning itself far to the right of the conservative movement. Its highly conservative position has allowed it to provide a clear self-definition that contrasts with more moderate and liberal political views. To examine the Tea Party's influence on American political prototypes, we manipulated the comparative context in which participants received an extreme pro-normative message from a Tea Party group. Conservatives primed with self-uncertainty, support of the support of the extreme position, indicating more conservative views for both themselves and similar others when primed when, with an intergroup versus an intragroup context. Results are discussed in terms of the ability for extreme group, in-group factions to polarize prototypes under self-conceptual uncertainty. Uh, so did I get anything wrong with your bio? Is there something we need to correct? Um, uh, I don't think here. you got it wrong, but I think I see a typo on my university website. So, um, cause I, it, within that bio, my university website, it says assistant professor, but now I'm associate. And then I see that it says that there. So I just wanted to, to clear that up and give a shout out to my own, uh, social identity lab here at Humboldt, Cal Poly Humboldt as well. Cause we have a big team of, uh, students and affiliates who work here, um, on this campus as well. So, and again, that's just stuff I'm adding for funsies. Uh, in no way did I want to insert, insult the Social Identity Lab at Humboldt University or it's less than the Social Identity Lab at the Claremont McKenna uh, Constellation of Universities. And please accept my sincerest apologies. To oh, no. no, not at all. I'm I just I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. the shout out all of the time. Thanks. Yeah, I, I try to keep it light because it gets pretty serious. Um, yeah. So let's go back in time. I want to go back to the year 2013. Yeah. yeah. What's going on in the year 2013? Why study yeah. this issue? Why is this an important issue? Why is this worthy of study? Well, Pretend like I haven't been alive. I wasn't there. What did you see as an American and as a research professor in 2013 where you said, this is something that needs to be looked into? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. And so... Um, and we started the work for this in uh, 2010, which um, coincides with the rise of the Tea Party in American politics. And um, 
at that point, we had these sort of two movements at the same time. So there is the Tea Party on the right, and then there's Occupy on the left. And um, as I would go out, because I like to go and watch actual movements. So if there was a demonstration of Tea Partiers, if you would call, they would be wearing their Revolutionary War era garb out with their um, tax enough already uh, signs. I like to go out and just watch those things and observe the behaviors. And then in addition to that, I would go to downtown LA where um, an Occupy movement was there. And as I was watching these and having conversations with other academics at my grad school, we came to the conclusion that one of those movements was going to be far more effective at pushing their side further away than the other one was. And that was the Tea Party because they um, seemed pretty organized. Um, they were catchy. So in terms of this comes from a min minority influence perspective, which is a perspective in social psychology, they they tick the Tea Party was ticking all the boxes. So a consistent message for the most part, right? Um, there was some amount of leadership within the um, Tea Party, captured attention. Um, all of those types of things tend to uh, to be characteristics of successful minority movements and successful in terms of, you know, uh, pushing people to a, a specific way, like influencing people a specific way. Whereas the Occupy movement didn't have a leadership structure. Um, all of the demonstrations I went to, people had totally different things written on all of their signs. It wasn't, um, so you didn't have this sense of consistency in their message. Um, and again, without having that leadership structure and things that could capture people's attention, it just seemed like that would be kind of a fizzled movement. And um, the framework that I, that we, my colleagues and I were coming from was um, looking at political polarization. So there was the, or looking at polarization, there was uh, Hogg, who's one of the, Mike Hogg, who's one of the um, researchers on that paper in 1990, he and um, David and Turner published a few studies on um, group polarization from a self-categorization perspective. And they were able to basically um, compute when polarization would occur and um, that polarization occurs in an intergroup context. So what that means is that if you have an in-group and an out-group, right? All right, let me start over. If, if we just take the, um, the Republican Party in the United States, right? Um, in the case when you have the Republican Party in the United States, and they're only thinking about themselves in terms of being a Republican, and not necessarily in, um, in comparison to anybody else, in comparison to an outgroup, they're just thinking about um, who they are as Republicans, then if they were to get a message that seems kind of far out there, right, um, from a party that's even further to the right from where they were, because the Republican Party was pretty dang moderate at that point in time, okay, um, that wouldn't be very attractive. It wouldn't be a successful minority movement. However, when it would be, and this is according to the um, Hogg et al. 1990 study, but it goes back to the Turner et al. 1987 stuff, um, in in the case where it becomes an intergroup context, wherein Republicans are now comparing themselves to both Democrats and part of their own, right? Because the Tea Party was nestled within the Republican Party. What the um, Tea Party would allow the Republicans to do is to psychologically distance themselves and be very distinct from the real outgroup, which is Democrats. And so um, we thought, this would be a really cool way to test some of the premises that we've been thinking about for years in terms of the uh, you know, self-categorization theory and to demonstrate that that actually occurs. Now, of course, you mentioned the, um, the economic uncertainty that people were feeling. Um, we come from, uh, my colleagues and I do research on self-uncertainty. And so um, self-uncertainty is described as a negative drive state. And this is where you kind of question who you are, where you're going in life. And this could be different. So what makes you, uh, Marcus, uncertain about who you are is likely different than when, what makes me uncertain of who I am, right? Um, and so it could be, for me, it is, oh my gosh, am, am I, uh, like, am I going to keep my job as a professor? Who would I be if I'm not a professor? That could make me incredibly uncertain, whereas you would be feeling something that would be could probably different than that. But because that's a negative drive state, I want to reduce it. And what the research shows and the um, theories predict is that one way that you can reduce that uncertainty is by really bolstering your group memberships, right? Because um, you have a, a part of your identity comes from the groups to which you belong. And um, you can use those groups 
um, they can fulfill basically epistemic motives, right? So they you gain a sense of who you are from them, right? So groups can tell you how to think, feel, act, and behave. Groups have certain characteristics that most members share in common with one another, and they also can prescribe to you norms how you should behave. So um, I'm for you to get to that. Yes, and then at the same time, those are the things that set you aside and make your group appear different from another group, right? And so you can use those group memberships to be like, oh, okay, okay I'm really uncertain about who I am, but guess what? Um, I am a member of the Republican Party. These are the norms that go along with the Republican Party. These are the ways in which I should behave. So you can use that group membership to reduce that uncertainty. So we wanted to come in and say that um, that certain factions can capitalize on people's uncertainties to a certain extent if they um, create a situation where we need to be different from an actual outgroup. And then they can use that to no longer be just a minority presence in a group that is ineffective, but they can use that to pull the group along with them as the group, mold, the group moves away from an actual outgroup. So that was kind of the, a lot of word vomit on theory for you. So no, 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 yeah. I, 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 so negative drive state means you're worried about something bad happening to you and the compulsion to deal with that is driving you towards action. Yeah. And so it's basically uncomfortable, right? We don't, we don't want to be uncomfortable. Discomfort, and so, right. Yep. And we want to get rid of it. And so um, with that sort of self uncertainty, when it's uncomfortable and we're not talking about like, oh, what kind of sandwich am I going to get? Unless that's really a core part of your self-concept. But this is those things about um, who you are that really make you feel uncertain that if you start to dwell on that, it can make you very uncomfortable. And so you look for reasonable ways to reduce that. And one of those ways is to use those uh, social identities that you have or those groups to which you belong. So you can kind of latch onto those norms and see yourself through the lens of the, the norms of those groups. A uh, couple of things. I've literally seen that. So I'm in the Central Valley. Um, yeah. We're we're dominant liberal, but just barely, and it's it's a slow process. Like I've told my conservative friends, it's changing and things aren't going your way, but it's going to take a while to get there. Like you know, 51, 56 percent versus 49. Um, I've seen a lot of people who did not have a job, did not have a career path but didn't want to be seen as a bum. And so they were like, went around, told everybody, I'm a Republican and I can't stand these homeless and bums on the streets. And a lot of us were thinking, you're the only one in our group that doesn't work. And none of us are running around going, I can't stand these homeless bums. I mean, I work. Um, so why are you who doesn't work so interested in calling yourself a Republican and going around and saying, I can't stand all these people that don't work. And I, I saw that once and I just dismissed it as weirdness. Then I saw it two or three more times and I'm like, hold on, there's a pattern here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you see these once you start seeing these things, you can't unsee them. And then you learn the jargon that we use to describe them. And you're like that. Yep. That makes sense. <laughs> That's the other thing is um, I want to totally back you up with Occupy. I said that I was a big fan of Occupy. I was even thinking of traveling out to New York City until I saw their list of demands printed in the New York Times. And it wasn't banking was like one of the things. And then it was like, make sure kittens aren't hurt and uh, make sure that we are more sensitive place to all genders. And I'm like, what does that have to do with going after the banksters who just collapsed our entire economy with predatory lending and knew damn well what they were doing and didn't care that 100 million Americans were going to be destroyed? You just diluted the message with a bunch of stuff that's going to polarize your group against each other. And that is exactly what happened. I called it the moment I saw that thing. They printed that list of demands and I go, this movement is dead. And I yep. said that day and it died a year later. No one yes. wanted to hear that when I said that. Oh, you're negative. You're pissed. I go, dead in the water. Dead. I'm not even joining now. Oh, you don't know that a year later. Oh, it petered out and nobody could agree. And everybody started fighting with each other and they were turned on each other and were so hostile because they didn't have a leadership organization. There was no clear leaders. And I like my opinion better than yours. So I will physically intimidate you in order to get my opinion into the Occupy uh, movement. There were many members of Occupy who said that's how policy decisions were made was people got up in your face. Yeah. And I mean, you can see all of that. These are, and again, this comes from the research on minority influence. And I'll now give Bill Prano a shout out because I've had the opportunity to write a few things with him on minority influence. And it's always lovely. But even going back to 
Moscovici's seminal work in Minority Influence, the first, one of the most basic things about, um, about moving groups, like moving, moving them in any direction is a consistent message. And then we're now starting to bring that leadership into it because what a leader does is it helps to clarify, when you have a leader, that helps to clarify what the group is. And the role of leadership cannot be overlooked. So if I ask you about certain um, movements over the years, if I said, can you describe to me what pops into your head when you think of the civil rights movement in the United States? Do you see any leaders in your head? Absolutely. Right. And so those the, that is one of the things that helps to clarify what a group is and also capture people's attention. And so when you're looking and if you want people to be a part of that group, that group needs to give people information about who they are. And so they need to have that target to look to. Right. And so that's the you know, that hugely important role of leadership in a group for good. And, the you know, I give the example of um, the civil rights movement having leadership structure there, but not all movements are for good. Right. And not all leaders uh, lead their what? groups. Yeah, I know. It's wild. Come so. on. Beer Hall push 1930s. Just a couple guys who wanted things to, you know, get better for uh, veterans. Yeah. What? <laughs> I'm joking. That was how the Nazi party got formed. Um, um, it also is so interesting with like, you know, the Nazi party and how it, and we'll talk about shared grievances at some part, but like you have a leader who really outlines shared grievances amongst their group, right? And the targeting of middle-class Germans and saying like, you know, that that is their, the source of people that they wanted to drag onto their cause and saying, guess what? You're experiencing all of these grievances. Your life is being made worse because Jewish people are getting more than you are. And that is that motivates people to anger and it motivates people to violence. So because they could see him when actually the real culprit was English and French bankers, but they didn't live in German society. Oh. So it's hard to go. Look, oh, there's an English banker. Go get him. Oh, there's a French banker. Yep. Go get him. There's a Jewish person. You can see him. Mm -hmm. uh, there's your problem. Oh, I can see it with my eyes. And then you can get everybody involved versus going academically. You'll never see these people. But here's 15 papers you can read about who the bad guys are in a separate country that you'll never see or visit. It, it's just not as sexy. It's like, uh, what do they say? We're not designed as humans to listen to there's a tiger next door. Watch out. But we are designed to see the tiger and freak out. Yeah. It just it doesn't it doesn't work. Oh, that watch out. There's a tiger next door. I can't show you. But believe me, if you see a tiger, you automatically jump into action. And it's just it was a little mental trick I heard about our brains. Let me ask you, though. Um, let's get to the meat and potatoes. So Tea Party movement. I need to form an identity. I need to form an extreme identity. They certainly did have leaders. I saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had very firebrand leaders who popped up out of nowhere and were quite willing to take the mantle for the Tea Party and the Tea Party is willing to follow them. And their their attitude seemed to be, you know, we're hardcore. We don't compromise like the weak Republicans. We're the real hardcore wing, uh, maybe the Azov battalion of the Ukrainian army, if you will. Why the need to do that? Why in 2013 do people suddenly say, we need to be super mega uncompromising and hardcore and start wearing costumes. Why did they not do that in 2000? I mean, they did. I saw them. Everybody was wearing that tricolored hat. It didn't work out here in California because most people in California didn't even know what that was. Yeah. Um, so I, it, it petered out here largely because people were like, what, what the hell are they dressed as? People didn't get it. So uh, yeah. versus the East Coast. Why did they need to do that? Why did so many people go, I've lost my sense of identity. I need to join something. <laughs> um, um, why did they, and, and why then? Why between 2010 and 2013 did this happen to so many people where they felt they had to join this? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, I, so I can give you what my opinion is on this for sure. And then I sure. think that this would be supported theoretically. What did we have in 2008, right? We had we had a new president who came in, okay? That new president looked a lot differently than any other president we'd ever had. And so a lot of those people who were then starting to claim that they had these grievances, right? They actually had a decent amount of money. So we're not talking about people who were legitimately poor. We're talking about people that had some other level of threat, 
right? And so that other level of threat, and this again is a hypothesis, but I can cite several studies that would lead me to uh, think that this hypothesis would be supported, is that you have people who had always felt represented by their leader because that leader was a reflection of how they looked, right? And then you have Barack Obama come in and that blows up our perception of what leadership is and what leadership can be. And he has this unifying message or attempts to have this unifying message. So I think that for some folks, you start to get this sense of like, oh, what if, what if I'm not represented in the American identity anymore, right? What if I'm not what people think about when they think about the United States? Okay. And so then you have this idea of like, okay, you get this sort of level of collective uncertainty for some folks and then this desire for movement. Again, that's from a social psychological perspective. We can always talk about the, you know, the economy and how that created uncertainty and things for sure. But I think that, you know, you have this kind of backlash to Obama was a, a big portion of that. Let me show you something, if I may. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a researcher, uh, she's from California, not that that should bias anybody. I'm biased towards California, but that shouldn't bias. Uh, anybody. come on, proud Californian here. So. A, a huge proud Californian and no, just being California doesn't mean we like high taxes and regulations. It's a cultural thing. I tried to explain to my friends who aren't from here. So, um, there's this book out, how civil wars start. Kind of a controversial firebrand title but it's by a person who could actually make that kind of statement her name is barbara f walter now barbara f walter um is a here i'll, I'll keep showing the title so barbara f walter is a cia analyst not a field agent she's not james bond she's the analyst she sits back and reads books and gives them ideas so just to put that in context she works out of san diego universities she's worked with them for about two decades so one of the things that she was tasked with her and some other social scientists was, we need to know when this country is going to collapse into chaos. We got agents in the field. Hey, next year, tomorrow, because what happened is a country would collapse and they'd have CIA agents in there and they didn't know. And then they're in a real lot of trouble going, oh, I, Bob's not coming back tomorrow. Why? The government collapsed. Whoops. So they realized they needed this thing to go, how close is a country to collapse so we know how careful to be with our people, our boys and girls that are traveling out there doing whatever they need to do. So they came up with this metric and it was based upon, I don't know, 15 different things and et cetera. And they got pretty damn good at predicting when a country was going to collapse. Um, and they would just use this and they would give it as a book to CIA. And I think some of it was published publicly, um, but a lot of it's for the agents and they got pretty good at going, oh, this country's close to collapse. And then it would collapse. Now, let me show you some of the material. What she's saying is that according to her metrics, America's next. Yeah. Walter has. Yeah. I listened to a podcast uh, that she was talking about this. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm not an expert for sure, but I like, I listened to a lot of podcasts. So I, was, I thought it was a cool one. Let me, let me read just for the audience, not for you, professor, but for the audience to follow along. Um, Walter has a political scientist fondness for data sets and numerical scales. She says the United States is firmly within the danger zone of a five-point scale measuring factionalism and a 21-point scale measuring a country's polity index, where a full autocracy gets a minus 10 and a full democracy gets a plus 10. We've slid from plus 10, full democracy, down to plus five in a few years, occupying what Walter and her colleagues call the not quite democratic and not quite autocratic zone of anocracy. The numbers serve a function, corralling troubled observations into a cold system of measurement that presents itself as beyond dispute, seemingly nonpartisan and scientific. Her numbers also allow her to offer empirical grounding for her work while she says her way, she makes her way towards some blunt uh, conclusions. Today, the Republican Party is behaving like a predatory faction. Uh, here's the two things. An ethnic entrepreneur. So there's two conditions. You have to have an anocracy, which is a not fully functioning kind of halfway democracy where the people sort of believe in the government. And yeah, you have elections, but they don't really have faith yeah. in the government. They just kind of go through the process of it, much like the Soviet Union in the last few years before it collapsed, where the people said, yeah, we vote and we follow you guys, but we don't really believe in this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the, that's an anocracy. You have to have that. And America is now in that, according to her. The other condition is you have to have as an ethnic entrepreneur seeking to amass power by making bigot appeals to a particular group that doesn't need an especially sophisticated disinformation campaign to get people fear, feel, feel fearful and despairing, convincing them to turn against a democracy that includes people they hate. There's comfort in assuming the autocracy has arrived with a military coup. Um, right. There is also crucially a once dominant group whose members are fearful, fearful that their status is slipping away. It isn't the downtrodden masses that start a civil war, Walter says, but rather what she and her fellow call scholars call sons of privilege, sons of the soil. Their privileged position was once so unquestioned and pervasive that they simply assume it's their due and they will take violence in order to cling to power. Is that some of the same motivation of the Tea Party? We used to be in control. Everybody used to look like us. We were the dominant group. Oh my God, that dude's not white. And and oh my God, now he's now he's hiring a bunch of non-white people. And and oh my God, there's a bunch of new positions that have been held by white people for the last 200 years, and now they're held by non-white people. And they're saying things that go against our tradition. Oh my God. Is that a little bit of what's going on? Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's this sense, and we've actually, and um, I think it was Richeson who, we, we borrowed some of the manipulations from some other um, scholars. I know Kim Rios has done some as well. But we've done some studies in which we uh, manipulate for white people. We give them context of like, you know, by the year 2050, we're going to be a, a minority, a majority minority country, right? And right now there are more babies of color being born than white babies. So it, this is a fairly simple method of threatening white people in this country. And I think one of the things, and you can see this within the language that Walters used there, um, and also like within the, the language that these people use is you, if you're talking about people who are sons of privilege, right? Where they're, they, they are being, some of them are being fed a message, and some leaders do this incredibly well, that we're going to start losing out compared to them. This is why the great replacement theory is scary as hell, right? It's like this idea that there are people who are coming in, and we should have more status than them, but they're going to come up to our status and then rise. And this long known to social psychologists, and uh, we have uh, relative deprivation, right? This perceived deprivation in comparison to another group. And that can also be perceived, that deprivation can occur when you think that that other group is on the rise and that they're overtaking you, essentially. And what all of the research shows on relative deprivation is that that makes people angry. Feeling deprived makes it angry on the collective level, for sure. And when I explain this to my students, I'm like, does anybody have a sibling who got more than them on something? How did that make you feel? Pissed off, right? But on the collective level, you get angry on behalf of the collective. And then we also see that that leads to collective action. Now, not all collective action movements go for positive change or what we would probably determine as positive change, right? But they're willing to, and, and in some of the stuff, so we've been doing some of this research as well, in some of those situations, people are actually willing to fight and die on behalf of that cause. Uh, fair enough. I've seen that on the right. I also point out when Chris Cuomo was on CNN, when it was a liberal news agency, and said live on TV and was criticized by absolutely nobody on the left. Hey, if you get into a political disagreement with some people, sometimes it's okay to punch them in the face. Yeah. Said that on TV. Nobody contradicted him. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. Yeah. And, you know, um, just so we we look at these processes on both sides and so we have several we have survey work um, both in um, the United States we collected the data around the time of uh, midterms and in Brazil uh, right after uh, right after Lula was elected right and so there were trucker riots going on at this point in time and um, we found that these processes occur in both uh, so Democrats and Republicans. They're willing to fight and die on behalf of the collective to the extent that they feel like they, their group is being deprived. And so you get that regardless of party in the United States. And then in addition, in the Brazilian context, you get that regardless of if they were a Lula supporter or a Bolsonaro supporter. And, and we were a little bit surprised because we were like the rhetoric from Bolsonaro. What? But then we, we saw it regardless. And so I think those. Thank you. 
yeah. So those processes and, you know, we're hopefully I didn't give too much away because my students would be like, that paper is under review right now. <laughs> so anyways, I think it's, it is, it's super important to see. And then also in terms of, you know, with, with Cuomo saying that nobody, if the, if it's only the people on his quote unquote side who are watching him, that's one thing, right? But as soon as you get somebody who's on the other side, who hears that, now that drives a wedge even further between mm -hmm. him, a, a bigger wedge, right? Because it's like that guy and everything he stands for and the group that he stands for is attacking all of us. So, Maxine Waters famously said in front of a bunch of crowd, go and harass people. If you see them in the streets, if you see them in the restaurant, go right up to their table and get up right up in their face. Yeah. She was also seen pushing a conservative reporter out of the way. She was never criticized by the left at all. That incidence of her pushing a reporter out of the way and saying, let's attack people where they sit, widely played all over Fox News. You almost never saw it on liberal news. So that absolutely riled them up. And the fact that the liberals wouldn't even acknowledge it yeah. or condemn it made them even more mad if yeah. they had condemned it it might have petered out it was the fact they wouldn't even talk about it wouldn't even condemn it uh god there was when she, the, the year that she did that that was played about every third day on fox news going by the way just letting you know what maxine waters did and here's the dims they said nothing but we're the violent party oh man did that animate them so big uh just for the audience lula silva was the liberal in brazil and bolsonaro was the conservative and Bolsonaro had some really extreme things to say. Uh, so, and he was a little bit aggressive like Trump, basically the Brazilian Trump. And so you'd expect more violence from him. But on the left, there's also violence. Um, one of my favorite things to bring up is, and this gets to the next question is, how bad is polarization now versus 2013? So you're looking at this in 2013 and going, it's at least significant enough. Um, how bad is it now? Before you answer, I do want to point out Thank you for mentioning that the left does this too. We can conclude that the right is worse at it. What bothers me is when I see many people say, oh, there's nothing the left's doing on, at, at all to make this worse at all. And I go, what about when Joe Biden was president and he went on TV with a blood red backdrop, which is highly unusual, two active duty Marines, which is highly unusual, and then seemed to say that 78 million Americans were enemies of the state that's a good way to calm us down as a people or a good way to start a civil war. And when I confronted liberals with this, they go, well, what's he supposed to do? Like he didn't do anything wrong. Or the other attitude was good for him. He should have been more hardcore. Mm. And I'm mm. like, do you understand how terrified Republicans were? They literally felt that for the first time in American history, an American president declared them enemies of the state. He almost, you could watch his speech and come to that conclusion as an independent observer. To then say, not hardcore enough, let's do more, seems like you have no concept of there's already a fire going and let's just pour gasoline on it. You, you don't even know that, oh, if we pour more gasoline, it's going to burn hot. They're like, no, I, I don't know that gasoline makes fire bigger. I don't know. Let's just pour it on there, see what happens. Uh, so I appreciate you mentioning that. We don't get many people on the left who will admit there's at least some mistakes on the left not just the, the attitude is it's a clean slate yeah and all it, them it's also and because how do i want to say this if you come at these things from a psychological perspective the mechanisms are there on both sides right and so then you get you're obviously we're getting differences because of who their leader is who our leader is what the norms are that are present but the psychological mechanisms that underlie these processes are there on both sides and so that's always been kind of a driver of the research that i do and yeah we do find differences sometimes right we weren't with that tea party study in 20 and we, we collected those data in 2010 we couldn't have found that effect on um the left because there if we were looking at a real movement there wasn't a um, there wasn't a complementary movement on the left in the country in that time. We wanted to, and we tried, and we could have uh, faked one, like made one up for the purposes of the study, um, but we wanted to use a real movement there, and the Tea Party was that movement. And so what is different now between then, and of course, uh, I know you, you know, all kinds of political scientists and things like that, um, is I think, and I mean, I've seen lots of folks say this, is the Tea Party really 
paved the way for what we're seeing now, right? We're, we get more and more of an emphasis on populism, particularly in the, on the right in the United States, right? And it's it, that slide keeps going. But you're very right, because then when, when that starts to happen and the left gets really loud, if the left appears to get aggressive, then the wedge gets even bigger. And then, of course, you get leaders who can come in and 100% capitalize on that and say, look, those people are bringing immigrants into our country. Those people are doing this. And so that says like those people are out to get us basically, right? And um, at the same time, that leader, because I rem remember in uh, 2016 when I was watching the, I was at the Republican National Convention and the Democratic <laughs> Convention. Oh. Yeah, I was there to collect data on protesters. But Oh, it's fine. I have Republicans as a friend. I, I will say this. Yeah. Trump was hilarious on the campaign trail when we didn't think he was going to be president. Yeah, it was. So to me, it was, was really just a joke. I, yeah. And it, so it was really interesting to me because I uh, I could get myself into the, the Bernie supporters like me. So they let me into the Democratic National Convention. The, uh, <laughs> the Republicans wouldn't let me in. Let's be honest. They're like, that's not know, nice, guys. There's there's this academic from California. Let's let her die. Um, so are you, whoa, whoa, whoa. are you saying there's bias? against Californians in the Republican Party in general, especially heard, after the reign of Trump? Have you heard? Yeah. But it was such a, it, I, so I went um, to a friend who was also there with data collection. So this is Justin Hackett. Um, he lives outside of Pittsburgh. So we went back to his place after the, uh, the Republican National Convention and we watched uh, Trump's nomination speech, right? And as I, I started, my phone's blowing up from a bunch of other academics who were like, this is literally the worst speech I have ever heard. And it's this is a bunch of word salad. And I was like, oh, no, you're listening to that from a certain perspective. That speech is incredibly effective for the people for whom it's intended. And so I think dog whistling. Yeah, it, it is. And it creates one of the things that it does. And this is the basics of like a, a social identity perspective and uh, from self-categorization theory is what that speech does and what he does incredibly well is he can produce differences between groups. This is what makes us different than them, right? And he does a lot of that, but he casts the net over people that he wants within that group, right? And he can use that to say, those people aren't us. And when you have a speech like that and like uh, some of his other speeches and you are saying, look at this vision that we are in for the United States. Our streets are burning, Our, you know, all of the things that he says creates this sense of uncertainty. And then at the end, I alone can fix it, right? Okay, now we can start talking about autocratic leadership and why that's so effective. It's particularly effective when people feel uncertain, right? And so he paints this picture of the uncertainty that we're experiencing in the United States as Americans, cast a net, we know who the others are, right? And we can say dog whistles, he gets to a point where it's no longer dog whistling, right? And then, and then you um, provide this really clear cut solution, right? And it's makes for a really effective rhetoric when it comes to, you know, getting people on your side. So is Trump more extreme than the Tea Party? Is he a more extreme evolution from the Tea Party? Things are bad then. Did they get worse? Or are you saying it's kind of this just as bad? It hasn't really. I mean, has it got worse in 10 years? Um, yeah, I, I yes, I think I think that the polarization has gotten worse in the last 10 years, for sure. Significantly yeah. worse, not just like a little baby amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that you're seeing in the index with uh, from the Walters book that you showed um, myself and your audience is that you, you, can, you can see that, right? <laughs> we have a lot of other charts. Uh, yeah, she's she's pointing out anocracy. And I, there was a study and nobody should question that because uh, John Stewart used to be okay. very big online a lot of liberals got their news from him and he covered a study towards the end of his show and it came out when i think obama was still president and nobody really wanted to hear this because you know obama's president we want to hear there's a new day but basically what the study did i think it was out of princeton university came out in 2014 and it had looked at laws that had been passed since the 1970s up to 2014. And basically what they found was that if corporate America or the rich wanted something, they almost got always got the laws they wanted. But the, if the middle class wanted something, they pretty much never got it unless it happened to coincidentally align with corporate interests. And I think they said 
something along the quote, uh, lines of quotes, the American middle class's desires have an almost zero significance on the ability to get a law passed. And that was looking over uh, 1970s, 40 years, and basically saying, we, you know, we're not really a democracy. You may call it that, but it's really uh, uh, oligarchy. And mm -hmm. Harvard University backed that up, and John Stewart covered it, and nobody criticized it. But then you didn't really hear about it because it was kind of contradictory to the, the narrative worth of Obama. But it said back then, no, you don't. You don't really get a democracy. That was 2014. I can only imagine it's gotten worse since. I mean, that was public information. That was the first time a bunch of universities came out and said, we studied it. For a fact, folks, you don't get what you should as citizens. And that's a bombshell. So nobody should doubt this. I can only imagine it's gotten worse as we've had more polarized Congress, more sessions where they can't make any bills get passed. I think Obama's presidency was the least productive Congress ever, not necessarily blaming him, but in terms of laws that got passed and the amount of times that they would stall the entire economy for a debt ceiling. And we're still doing that. Mm -hmm. So it, it hasn't gotten better. Mm -mm. No. Well, and then also some of, I mean, we can start talking about gerrymandering and all of those things, which the, you know, um, and again, I'm not going to go into the political science of stuff. The Tea Party did that really well, but also that that is still occurring right now. And so, you know, where people, where our votes are coming from, who's being represented in specific districts, all of that. And so you have the, you know, those, uh, the political structure, which has been changed is going to contribute to that. And also you have people who are making a career in leadership by pointing out how we are suffering in comparison to them. And I use that we, because again, it's the same thing that you're seeing Walter saying in that book is that, um, you know, creating this sense of, outgroups who are coming after us so that it mobilizes followers. And when you get polarization between groups, the extremists on each side, right? The extremists on each side are the people who get those leadership positions. So it it benefits your Marjorie Taylor Greens to say some of these things out loud, right? And to say them out loud, it captures attention, it positions her you know, further over to the right, but that's where people wanna be if you're pointing out that the outgroup is coming for us, right? So. I want to ask you about that. So some people have said our polarization is because of extremist politicians. Uh, extremist politicians seem to pop up towards the last two years of Trump's presidency. And he, he set the stage. So we can look at maybe like 2018 for extremist politicians. Uh, gerrymandering, according to my research with political scientists, historians, wasn't really a problem until the 2000 election, that's when the Republicans under Bush started to try to rig it again. And you could really argue maybe it wasn't really a problem until 2010. That's when they got it operationalized. So somewhere around 2000 to 2010. And then when you look at social media, social media wasn't really a problem influencing elections until maybe 2010 to 2015. I would argue 2014, but you could put it at 2010. Mm -hmm. So here's my question for you. Have you heard of the thing called the big sort? So the big sort is an idea that Americans are sorting themselves into separate communities. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're getting polarized. And I remember when Marjorie Taylor Greene made her comment on President's Day, we need a national divorce. And that's kind of what started this interview series. I wanted to see what people thought about her. And I understand a lot of people don't like her. Some people love her and view her as fearless and a hero. Other people don't like her and think she's inartful and says horrible things. And when she came out on President's Day and said we need a national divorce because red and blue can't live together, it was not totally clear what she was getting at. Was she talking about new states being born, separating counties, full-blown secession, or what? And she had to come back the next day and say, I mean a negotiated settlement in Congress, and I don't mean X and Y. So, yeah, there was mistakes. But here's the thing. This is a map from uh, New York Times, came out mm -hmm. in 2016. Mm -hmm. It's based on the book called The Big Sort. The Big Sort is a book by a guy called Bill Bishop, came out in the 90s. And what he said was that Americans are sorting themselves into communities. Um, I'm a liberal in Texas. I leave and go to San Francisco or New York. I'm a conservative in the Central Valley. I leave and go to Texas. I move to some place where I feel people fit me more better. Now, there's some debate on if they're going, I can't stand the fact that 
Californians vote this way and I want to go someplace where my vote matters, or if it's more of a general ideology thing, like I, I want a slower pace of life, I want a more traditional family values type setting. Either way, it appears that people move to a new area and then they start to vote like the people in the area. Mm -hmm. So here's this map. In the top left corner, I know it's a little bit hard to see, top left corner is 1992. So red means, and this is presidential election uh, voting by county. So red means don't even run here um, because Republicans always, if you're a Democrat, Republicans always win by 20 percentage points or more, what's called a landslide election county. You're winning by 20 percentage points. There's no chance for the other person. Blue in that top left map means don't even run here if you're a Republican. It's hardcore Democrat country or what my aunt would call my tia, yellow dog Democrat. Um, now, most of America in that map in the top left is gray. You'll see blue, red, mostly gray. And then the other maps go through the different years. Now, the map at the bottom is 2016. And if you look at the map in the top left and you compare it to the one directly below it at 2016, you can see how almost all of the gray has been completely wiped out. Mm -hmm. That means from 1992 to now, we've basically lost our ability to have competitive election counties where maybe one year you vote for McCain and then the next year you vote for Obama because you like their message. You felt what they were selling at that moment fit the country and what the country needed better. We used to be able to do that in most of America. Now that's wiped out and we have landslide election counties for almost all the country. That's not the only map that shows this. It's one of my favorite ones. I know this is a little bit hard to see, but the map on the left is presidential elections by county in the year 2000. The one in the center is presidential elections by county in the year 2020. I know it's a little hard to see, but what you can tell is the one on the left, 2000 election, there's a lot of light pink and light blue. Mm -hmm. We go to the 2020 election in the middle, all hard red and hard blue. Yeah. It backs up the other maps. What they've been saying is that since 1992, maybe earlier, Bush, Bishop just says at least from 92, I've heard people going, saying it goes back to the 60s. I don't know. At least from 1992 to now, or basically three decades, we've had the American people moving and sorting themselves out at the county level and making it where we have super polarized elections. And you can literally see this transform over years. For comparison, the map on the far right is from 1968. 1968, I wasn't alive, but as I understand, was the most politically charged, polarized year of the famous 1960s era. The 1960s, where, oh my God, the 1960s is so horrible compared to now. Okay, 68 was the most politically charged year, period, according to every political historian. That map's mostly light red and light blue. Mm -hmm. And even when they were mostly politically charged, people just barely sort of voted for Nixon over the other guy. They weren't like wedded to Nixon. They thought maybe he fit what the country needed at the moment. That map on the far right looks nothing like the map in the center. We used to have mostly light blue, light pink. Now it's all hard red. Uh, let me show you something else if I can. There, That's not by itself. So here's another study from the Wall Street Journal came out in 2020. Uh, it's based upon the Pew Research Center on ideological silos. Pew Research Center is a very reputable organization for everybody watching. In 1974, the number of Republicans who identified as hardcore conservatives was 45. In 2016, it's 76. In 1974, the number of Democrats who identified as hardcore liberal was 28. In 2016, it was 59%. If you look at the chart, you can see kind of a straight line out to roughly 1992, and then it starts projecting upwards and we went from below half to over half. Here's the last one I'll show you. Uh, this is from Time Magazine. Uh, came out a few years ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know what this is? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. So in 2012, only one third of voters would say that they would not date someone out of their political party. By the year 2020, it had increased to over half. So 
I bring these up because people go, oh, that pulls off, that pulls off. So I go, here's a smattering of surveys and polls from multiple organizations over multiple years, all kind of getting at the same thing. It's the people. And my question to you is, how could extreme polarization be caused by only extreme politicians if they got started around 2018, social media if they only got started around 2010 to 2015, or gerrymandering if that got started around 2000 to 2010, if the big sort predates all of them by decades and decades? How could that not be the solution to the problem? And the second question is, the day after Marjorie Taylor Greene said we need a national divorce, I can't tell you how many articles I came out going, oh, she's an idiot. Don't listen to her. When that didn't work out a month later, you saw a new round of articles coming out going, okay, polarization is real. It's because of extremist politicians. It's because of social media. It's because of gerrymandering. Every single article forgot to mention the big sort, even though it's been widely documented for decades and even though it predates all of these other trends. How did everybody forget that? And how is the big sort not the best answer when we're looking at polarization, given that it predates the other things by 10 to 30 years? Yeah, I mean... So I think one of the things that you highlight there is that we can't blame one specific leader or a subset of leaders because I come from the perspective that um, you don't have leaders without followers, right? And so the type of research that we do from an identity leadership perspective or a social identity theory of leadership perspective is the people that we prefer to be our leaders, that we support and elect as our leaders are those people who we feel best represent who we are. And so to the extent that we still live in a representative democracy, that should be the case because people are casting their votes for the people who they believe best represent who they are. And so they are looking for people that are reflections of who we are, right? And so you can't say this was caused by a single leader. It is this person encapsulates those things that we are, thus we support this person. They best demonstrate who we are to the rest of, you know, if it's the nation or if it's your department chair, whatever the case is in terms of leadership, right? So, and, and that's pretty true. That's a very robust fact. We um, say there's a, in uh, my field, it's the prototypical leader advantage. And, um, you know, it's a very robust finding for the last like 25, 20 years. So, so I, I think it's really, to only blame so like well i don't blame you blame social media you blame people right because the even though those there are all algorithms on social media the algorithms are meant to those algorithms are mimicking the processes that um we hold as humans right so if you can't blame social media you can't blame any individual leader because then that takes the influence out of the hands of the people who put those those leaders there like that's incredibly problematic so yeah, I agree with all of that. It's, it's good stuff. I've heard people say, well, the only reason extremist leaders are getting elected is because that's the only option the parties leave. And, and people don't really want extremist leaders. That's just all they get. And what I'm hearing from you is something that I more thought. The problem starts with the people and they pick what they like. You, I, I've, I've thoroughly believe this. And I'd, I'd work really hard to not give my opinion because I want to make sure all the interviews are unbiased. I like liberals thinking I agree with them. I like conservatives thinking I agree with them because I want to get the information out and for you, the public, to have to think for yourself. That's why I do this. But uh, this idea that it's it's people get what they vote for. I've seen this many times. Why did uh, people outside of uh, California go, why is Gavin Newsom saying these wild and crazy things? And I go, because the people of California like it. Why is governor whatever Texas saying these crazy things? Because average Texans like that. I have family in Texas. I'm from California. I mentioned those two because I knew we'd go. We'd have family go, oh, my God, your elections were rigged and it was stolen. And that's why crazy Newsom took control. And then he said we need to have safe spaces for transgender bathrooms. And he's forcing that on you guys. And I go, no, 80 percent of the people here like that and told him to do it. What? Yeah. No, no, it, the election was rigged and it's forced on you. And I go, no, if you don't like the crazy stuff he says, that's fine. Just recognize we all drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah. California phrase. So you can think we're all weirdos. Okay. Yeah. Same thing with Texas, though. I see liberals go, no, uh, they're extreme Republicans taking over their government. And they like guns and God. Okay. They're never going to stop. 
and football. That's a national religion over there. Um, and for us to say, well, you know, if we if we just get Beto O'Rourke in, he'll change the way Texans think about guns. Garbage. Uh, he has to be prototypical or representative of the group in order to get elected. Now, there's this real fun thing that happens that once someone steps into a position of leadership and they are deemed to be prototypical of the group, we then give them, because we're looking to them for cues on what it means to be a member of that group. And again, we can be talking work groups. We can be talking about states. We can be talking about nations. We identify ourselves in a variety of different ways with a variety of different social groups. But once that person takes that leadership position, now they're the source of influence within the group. So we are looking to that person for cues on how to think, feel, act, and behave. So once that person is in leadership, then they might move us, right? But they had to first represent us to get into that position in the first place. And so once they're in, then they really have the ability to transform things. But it's not until that point that they're in. And to get in, they have to I almost pulled out a too short reference. That would not have been great on there. No, you can. I'm a big hip hop fan. Please do it. Please do a too short reference. I was gonna say no, you, you, you can't tease. You can't. Win. I was just going to say you get in where you fit in. But like, <laughs> but so. Yeah. Getting while the getting is good. <laughs> okay. No, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, but I mean, it's, and, and it's such, it's, it's a very basic principle and you're, you're dead right. Like we, they are representatives of us when they get in and then they might shift us, but we're not, they're not doing it because we don't want them to. We're going along with it. And so this is where it's hook, line and sinker at this point. I appreciate that. I have a theory. And if you disagree, please say so. I want honest conversations. I love when people disagree with me because it's about getting the facts right for me. If it's extremist politicians, we can change the laws and we can educate the voters and maybe get those those people out or change the way the voting is to not allow that. If it's gerrymandering, we can have better laws for gerrymandering. If it's social media, we can regulate the social media companies. There's some law, there's some things that we could fix and fix this problem. But if it's the people doing it themselves over three decades, that's not fixed by any law. There's no quick solution. It's a long hard, slow, three decade long generational process with a maybe we make it at the end. That's depressing. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about, I know AOC could get together with Matt Gates and they could just reform social media and, and the Humpty Dumpty gets snacked right back together again. I think that's the story people want and they don't want to hear, sorry, hard work, you did it to yourself. You brought this on yourself for generations. Now it's going to take generations to get out of here, like teaching us that women have the right to vote or African-American people are the same. That's a long term project with a lot of pain and a lot of pushbacks and a lot of mistakes to eventually get there. Now, you can do it. We've done with both of those movements, although there's still room for improvement. But compared to the 1900s, we did. But it took generations. What do you think about that theory of that's negative and depressing? I want to hear something that tells me, yeah, it's a problem, but it can be fixed. And in the next year or two, and we can pop everything back into place. Am I wild and crazy for thinking that? No, I think that's, that's completely reasonable, right? And we don't want to think that the solution is outside of our lifetimes. And we want to have a sense of efficacy in it that, okay, we can come to a solution. Absolutely, right? But I think one of the things that that does, and I think this is in, inherent in what you said, is that if we think that it's that simple, we're not willing to do the work right now for it, right? And so then you get people who like put the brakes on that and they focus on the immediate. And so, yeah, it just contributes to that process lasting even longer. Second, which equals that problem lasting even longer turns out folks if you don't actually recognize the reality of the problem and you don't actually address it it festers the analogy i would routinely have would be if you have a cancerous sore on your leg and i come to you and say hey that looks like cancer on your leg i don't want to discuss that that's negative but it could kill you yeah but that's negative I want to talk about how 
it's just a bruise. But we don't really know that. And you're not really a doctor to say that. But yeah, okay, but you're assuming it's cancer and that's negative. So I'm going to assume it's just a bruise. Because that's positive and you can't prove it's cancer. Yeah, but I want to have the discussion to get into it. I don't want to do that, bro. That's really depressing. Mm-hmm. That's how I feel we handle problems these days. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it's easy and it's happy and there's a quick fix and we can bomb something or pass a law, great. We're all about it. If it's you're gonna have, if it's a John F. Kennedy moment, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. You need to give yourself to your nation, be willing to sacrifice for the betterment of your country. Um, I'm not sure Americans up for that anymore. I hope so, but I'm not going to be able to comment on that. That is a depressing thought. So I think I'm just going to think about something happier right now. <laughs> <laughs> Cocaine Bear is a great movie. Go see that. It's a, it's a, it's a yuck. Perfect. A family film. The Cubs <laughs> and the mom come together as a family to maul the guy who is harming them, but they do it as a family. So yeah, a there family. you go. It's a family. I tried to tell my mom that. She was like, I'm not going to watch that. <laughs> Mom, the mom bear helps the cubs and, and they come together as a family. Isn't that yeah. rewarding? And I go, yeah, they gored this man alive, but still as a family, no buyers. Um, okay, folks, the thing you got to understand is that if you're not lying, laughing, you are crying in activism. I learned that being an activist for 10 years. Please don't take my mood as any indication that I don't take the subject super seriously. Uh, we're winding down. One of the last few questions I want to ask you is, Teen Party comes up, pretty extreme. Then Trump comes up, even more extreme. Does this mean we're on the path for a mega Trump, somebody even more extreme than Trump? I'm looking at the trend line here. Teen Party, (laughs) Trump, looks like we get someone even worse in the future. Or is that not realistic? And and maybe I should be thinking that. Um, I mean... It's, it's a good question. And it's also a good, I mean, just in terms of the, the theories that I operate under, it's realistic, right? Because what you have is movements with, you're not, you don't just have one individual or a faction, a fa- even a small faction of people within a group that's moving, but you have a whole group that is moving, right? And so when that occurs, if you have a situation in which someone wants to capture the attention and wants to, um, get that leadership role themselves, it can benefit them to post an even more extreme position because that, again, captures attention, all of that. And as long as you're still in that intergroup context in which it's an us versus them environment, then that extreme position should be theoretically incredibly appealing. So it seems based on theory that that's incredibly realistic, which again, I don't wanna paint a doomsday scenario for anybody. It's a theory. Yep. It's a theory. It's a theory. We're saying it's a theory, but it's not a crazy theory. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. So it could happen. Doesn't mean it's going to, but folks, it's bad enough now where thinking along those lines is not insane anymore. So as I, my family would tell me when I started with activism, when I started in uh, 2012, uh, they, they thought it was nuts. And then the last few years, my brother has been saying, you know, all that nuts so stuff you've said for 10 years becomes increasingly less crazy every single year. That was his gift to me of going, I thought you were nuts, but seem, things keep seem to go on like this every single year. And I'm like, damn, was my crazy brother right? I mean, I, 10 years ago, he was saying this, I didn't see it, but every year I see a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And he's got a daughter and he's worried. So, um, You can't talk about it in detail, and I respect that. You have upcoming research coming. I get that. Don't want to offend any of the students. We really appreciate young Californians coming up. To the degree that you can about the study or in any capacity, one of the things that you mentioned we were talking was working on a study where you can predict when or where there will be a loss of polarization. If you can talk about your study, great. If you can't, then you can talk in general. How do we become less polarized? (laughs) How do we come back together? 
Yeah. So there, I mean, a few things just talking in broad brushstrokes. One is, um, so we talk about from a social identity perspective, uh, people's motives for uh, group identification and for social identity. And the motives are, um, there's an epistemic motive, right? And so how this, when it becomes a threat is when people feel uncertain. And so then they look they look for information that they can use to reduce that uncertainty. So there's that epistemic requirement. But then you also get the enhancement requirement where people like to feel good about who they are and they like to feel good um, when it, it becomes a collective process. They like to feel good about who they are based on that group membership, right? And so sometimes how that ends up coming up is making favorable comparisons to an out group, to an in group. So basically saying this is why we're better than them in this way, right? But the distinction between groups as well helps to clarify who I am in this group. So if I know, if I'm really uncertain about who I am, right, um, and I'm a Democrat, and I know that the, the differences between um, Democrats and Republicans are really clear, then that gives me a significant amount of information that I can reduce that uncertainty. Mm. So like a, a super broad level, if you would address people's uncertainties, which how the hell do we do that? I don't know. That's for, you know, that's for people who go outside. I actually go outside a lot, but who go outside and get their hands dirty. But um, but there's, you know, reducing people's uncertainties, but also reducing and then addressing the fact that people need to feel good about who they are based on their group memberships. And how do you how do you allow people to do that when um, those group memberships are like they're so intertwined? Right. And so um how do I want to say this? Knowing who we are and feeling good about ourselves becomes this sense of, well, at least I'm not a Republican because those guys suck based on X, Y, and Z. Or Republicans, like, at least I know who I am as a Republican and I know that I'm not those Democrats because those guys suck based on X, Y, and Z. So how do you address that? There's That is a question. People always pose the idea of creating a superordinate category. If we could just get everyone to think about themselves as Americans, that'd be great. But people based on their political identities, and you can see this on the map right there, based on their political identities are projecting their own political identity onto the superordinate category, which is the nation, right? So if I'm a Democrat, I think, you know what real America is? It's, it is liberal ideology, right? And you get Republicans doing the same thing. You know what real America is? It's now conservative ideology, right? And so you don't have this sense of like, oh, no, we're all just thinking about ourselves as Americans, right? You still get that distinction between groups. So that becomes incredibly difficult. We have a f uh, few studies published uh, where we showed we could get people to uh, buy into the other side's message. But how we did it was real tricky. And so uh, we created, so we showed this with both Democrats and Republicans because we like to do the research on both sides. And what we saw is that um, in the comparative context, let's say, um, let's say we're picking on Democrats, right? So um, we have a we have a sample of Democrats and we wanna see if we can get them um, to buy into a Republican message, okay? If we place that Republican message alongside an even more extreme Republican message, then the more moderate, what appears to be the more moderate message, Democrats feel much closer to, and they actually are more willing to um, change in terms of that uh, as a in terms of that message. And but it requires the extremist group there, and so that is even if. The message is the same, regardless of the extremist group being present. If you only present a moderate message by itself, the Democrats didn't want anything to do with, do with it. But if you present it um, alongside an extremist message, then the Democrats feel closer to it and then they're more willing to buy into it. And we showed that mm -hmm. same process on the other side. And um, that's an interesting yet tricky way to do it, right? So... <laughs> But, and again, I didn't provide any solutions. I always tell people I study the worst form of negative psychology, so. Somebody has to. Um, well, I remember my, my Theo was talking to my, I would go over to my uncles and we'd watch war movies. And then my Theo was like, why do you watch disgusting war movies? And I go, somebody has to understand war because there's going to be wars in the future. And if you don't have generals and people learning how to do this, you know, somebody's got to understand how to run a morgue. Somebody's got to understand how to embalm bodies. 
or yeah. people have to do these things or society collapses. Uh, one of the last questions I want to ask you. Uh, good. If you could bring your face closer to the camera, because I want to judge your face. On this okay. As Norman Ornstein of the American Inter Enterprise Institute has pointed out, by 2040 or so, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states, meaning 30% of Americans will choose 70 senators, and the 30% of Americans will be older, whiter, more rural, and more male than the 70%. He's talking about how most people are moving to cities on the coasts. Mm -hmm. They're leaving states in the interior and how we've already had two presidential elections where the person who won the popular vote did not win the presidency. And he's saying you can expect a lot more of that up to the year 2040 and even more polarization because what's happening is, let's, let's take Kentucky. Janie and Junior leave and go to the cities because it's cool or there's concerts or there's the jobs. New immigrants don't move to Kentucky because they see it as racist. University professors don't necessarily move there for the same reason. And they're they, taking our academic freedoms, huh? So yeah. so, yeah. So you start to have no minorities, no immigrants, no liberal thinking, no young people. And what that leaves is all old, white, rural, Fox News watching, and they never run into anybody who thinks differently. And he's saying the census is projecting this will continue for about 35 states to the year 2040, which means they will control every election in the future, even though there'll be a fraction of the population. Um, good sign, bad sign, definitely will calm down polarization, or this is going to new levels we've never even seen before, folks. Yeah. Which one in your opinion, Professor Gaffney? Ooh, um, Nothing to worry about or what? Well, I, I feel, yeah, what? Because just in, in terms of who we are as a nation, if the people who are casting all of the ballots aren't the only people who represent who we are, that's incredibly problematic. So, yes, yes, that... That would be very concerning. So when Trump won the election, even though the majority of the people uh, elected Hillary and when Bush won the election, even though the majority of the people elected Gore is not good. Is that a fair statement? <laughs> um, well, yes, I will say that, but I, I, I don't like to be pinned into things, but um, Sorry. Sorry. And so th that's, that's yeah, because what you end up seeing is that's when what ends up happening is it makes the side who lost call into question the legitimacy of the system. Now, how legitimacy works is the system only remains in place because people aren't tearing the system down because they believe that that system is legitimate, right? It's like the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court holds a lot of power, but it holds power because people think that they are a legitimate entity. Now, as you start to see that being questioned, there's going to the Supreme Court, if there was some overthrow with the people, could get rid of the, the Supreme Court, right? Say, actually, that's not a law that I follow. And so when you talk about the destruction of nations or civil wars, right, which is what that book you, that you brought up was talking about, you have this where people question the legitimacy of the system and then go to a, a sense of extremes. I don't know if it's even extreme at that point where they want to tear all of that down. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. It, it, yeah, it does. It does. Um, and I, I, wanna, I have one last question for you. Uh, just for a fact, uh, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Koulinakis said we will defy the court when they issue their rulings. Sitting Lieutenant Governor of the world's fifth largest economy said that. The world's fifth largest economy, second most powerful leader said we will defy the court. Language like that. I've talked to enough historians, was last seen in 1860. I'll leave it there. So here's my last question. A lot of people said, oh, it's bad now, but compared to the 1960s, uh, I don't know. Uh, now, one thing I've heard is the 60s were definitely more violent than what we're experiencing now. Okay. But the other theory I've heard that would explain why it's worse now than the 1960s gets at what you're talking about. 
In the 1960s, people had shared belief in the presidency, the Congress, the Senate, the Supreme Court, uh, police, school, etc. Americans now suffer from the least amount of faith in all forms of government in the last 40 years. And they're well, actually and, and also bring into that our other checks and balance, right? So if we're talking about the press. And so when you have people who can't believe or buy into the press, that is also incredibly problematic. And yeah, so just to add to that. So go Thank ahead. Thank you. That's a great one. That's a great one. People doubt the press. They doubt the presidency. They doubt the Congress. They doubt the Supreme Court. They doubt the police. They doubt, doubt education. In fact, the only institution in America where confidence has gone up, the United States military. That's basically it. That's the one thing in America that most Americans feel like, yeah, that's number one, because it's it's still pretty good at blowing other countries up better than anybody else. But that's about it. Our ability to destroy other countries is the one thing that we all think we're doing pretty good at. And when we come to how well does our own government function, we have the la least most lack of faith seen in the last four decades. When we go back to the 1960s, people seem to believe in common institutions. And as all they had different opinions, they still rep recognized that if the Supreme Court said something, that's the rule. If the president was elected, that was the, elec the election. For example, we didn't see people on the left saying, I'm going to deny your guy was elected president for the next four years. Oh, yeah, well, I'm going to deny your guy was elected president for the next four years. Maybe things were more polarized in the 1960s, but they had this common pole bringing them all together. People are saying we don't have that now. We, we don't have common faith in institutions. We doubt each other's elections. And that's new and scary and not seen in the 1960s. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, and again, I'm not a historian, but from sure. everything I've read, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what are the winning lotto numbers for this weekend? Whew, um, I have no idea, but people should usually take 44. That's a great number. What is the best movie for people to watch on Friday night? On Friday night? Tommy Boy is a good one. Oh! <laughs> uh, when he's with David Spade and he slams the car door. Yes. And, it's all crushed, and then he pushes it back into the car. And then he sits down and David Spade goes up to the car, grabs the car door and it pulls off. And he goes, what did you do? <laughs> yep. oh God, yep. I, I lost it on that. I, yeah. I, oh, Chris Farley. I know. I, I lost it on that one. I, uh, I, I watched it about five times and I could not stop. Um, yeah, yeah, I feel like I might have seen it much more than five times. <laughs> I'm saying I watched that scene five times. I've oh, seen yeah. that movie a lot. Um, so many, yeah. Um, last question. Um, I hope you feel that we did a fair interview. This wasn't gotcha journalism. We didn't try to set you up. You're able to say your piece. Uh, do you know anybody else who might be willing to be part of an honest conversation about this? You could think of. Sure. Um, for sure. Would you like me to send you a couple of names of folks? With I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. We want to keep the conversation going. Okay. Very last question. This is the thing I always ask the audience usually, unless they already answered it. I want you to picture yourself as not you, you're a person outside of this. You're watching the video. You're not you, you're not me, you're a person, you're watching the video. Okay. You watched it. We've talked for a while. We've covered a lot of good stuff. You're a third party person. You're watching this. You go, oh, you know, I watched that interview and there's a lot of good stuff. But five days from now, they're saying to themselves, there was a lot of material. I remember some of it, but there was this one thing that the professor said, and I can't get that out of my head. What is that one thing you want the audience to remember five days from now that they can't ever forget? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, if they remember the theories, that'd be great. But I think um, probably more importantly is to understand that the norms are different with respect to groups, and we've been talking about like two specific groups right now, right? The norms might be different within each group, but the processes that lead people to um, deem those things normative are the same regardless of the group. So you get these basic cognitive level processes that underlie intergroup relations. That is how my own group treats an out group and vice versa. And those basic processes apply regardless of the group, right? And so again, the normative- ah. 
Yes, the normative content is different and the expression of these things will be different based on those groups, right? But the processes that lead people to make the decisions about what news to watch, what news not to watch, what candidate to select are gonna be the same. So the underlying motivations are there. And I think that's a really important thing to understand when you are, um, especially if you want to contribute to science, right? And you use, you look at things like people's political identities. I think it's really important to keep those things in mind, so. Let me translate if I may. Hey, liberals, I know the Republicans are doing all sorts of nasty stuff, but you're humans too. And all humans are capable of bias. Never forget that. Am I close? Yes, that's, uh, I mean, I start off most of my classes saying, like we, even even when I teach stats, we all hold biases. And I hope that that's one of the things that you're going to get out of this semester, because if we can't address the fact that we have biases, then um, we're not gonna change them, so. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I'll send you a copy of the interview in a few hours. If you have any recommendations, you want to keep the um, interview going. You were awesome. I really, really appreciate you being willing to delve into the theoretical. A lot of people are not willing to do that. You were. Um, you kept boundaries up. I respect that. But you were able to answer the questions. And that's nice because okay. this kind of conversation is not widely available in a way that the public can digest. And so I feel this is a really good interview and has a lot of quality information that lay people can absorb. Um, Absolutely. We'll thank leave it there. So oh, sorry. I said, thank you so much. It's been really nice to speak with you. I really appreciate it. I will email you shortly and I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right, thank you.